So my boyfriend just came in and asked if I was doing my Harry Potter film. <laughs> Hi guys, today is the first episode in my Discworld series. Today I'm going to be talking about The Colour of Magic and The Light of Fantastic. These books are my least favourite of the whole series. I've done a lot of thinking and trying to think of whether there's any competition for least favourite, but all the rest of them are fine. It's just these two, especially Colour of Magic, there's a big step up in The Light Fantastic. The reason I think that I don't like these books, and a lot of people do say they're not the best ones to start on, definitely, is firstly, Terry Pratchett is finding his way around the Discworld. He's still trying to work out what it is and how it works. And the problem is that he hasn't yet decided that he's going to be playing on the real world. What he's doing at the moment, it's satire, on a certain type of fantasy. They were published in 1983 and 1986. This was quite a while before I was born. Well, eight years and six years before I was born. Five years, I mean five years. I have a maths degree. Anyway, they were written before I was born and the sort of fantasy it's making fun of was also before I was born and also something that I've never been that fond of because it, the world had already moved on by the time I got there and I was already reading. Terry Pratchett and people who'd gone to the next level of fantasy and made it a little bit more grown up. What I do like about this book is it's really interesting seeing the characters just before they've really properly developed. There's so many of them and there's so many characters which come more fleshed out later on, uh, from death to dibbler. Things like the broken drum, which then becomes the mended drum later on. All the different parts of the Discworld are starting to grow. They travel around so much of the world. They see so many people, witches, wizards, all sorts of things. It gives you that flavour of all the things he yet to come. And it really feels like Pratchett went back to these books later on and went, huh, I like this character, let's find out more. So, while reading, I did make a pile of notes. And some of the things I really wanted to sort of bring out was the early wizards. They're so different than the later wizards and Pratchett does talk about this because obviously once Rid Cully comes along in the later books um, and leads all the wizards, he's much stronger, also no one else wants the job and he kind of brings all the wizards together and it's less about the infighting. Whereas in this one it's loads of different fractions of wizards who all seem to just hate each other and just faff around. But the general background characteristics are still there, this sort of stupidity, this sort of academic blur. One thing I will say about Pratchett is remember he never went to university, he has honorary degrees but he left school and went straight into work. So it is interesting to think about that sort of dynamic of how he thinks of universities and it really feels, rather than anything jealousy based, it's definitely something along the lines of you go to university to sort of wither. I, I need to go and look and find some quotes from Pratchett around university. He was one of the most well-read people that I've ever seen and it's quite amazing that he never learned any of that at university, it was just all self-taught, learning stuff for his books. I went to a talk by his assistant Rob um, last year and it was quite funny to listen to him talking about the work he did for Pratchett which was basically some of it was just writing essays on subjects because Pratchett wanted to learn about them and that, I want that job. Actually, I don't want that job, I want the money to pay someone to write me essays on things I want to learn about. But that was how Pratchett worked, he really learned about stuff and absorbed things. That's not what the wizards are doing, the wizards are there to eat food and get tenure. And although you later on again you get different wizards who are there to learn, in The Colour of Magic and The Light Fantastic it's definitely, you know, the thing about Rincewind is he can learn so many languages but that's not something that the wizards appreciate and they think he's completely worthless because he only knows one spell. Another aspect that gets brought up in these books which um, appears later on is dragons. Now when we get to guards guards we'll definitely talk much more about dragons but here the dragons are much more classical. Later on they're the swamp dragons things like that and he has a very specific way the magic works but in this one it's definitely a play on fantasy dragons. And this is another thing I've been reading about. Um, I read a paper which I'll link to below because I can't remember who wrote it right now and it was talking about satire on fantasy. Things like Barry Trotter and the Board of the Rings series. They're making fun of big franchises and the way you write one of those books is you make it in that universe that's already been created 
but a little bit on its head. Rather than Middle Earth, it's Lower Middle Earth. Rather than Hogwarts, it's Hogwash. And these worlds, it means that the world building isn't as well done because frankly who can do world building as well as Tolkien? I think with Harry Potter the world building is not that good anyway so... But basically Pratchett is doing that here. Yes we've now got maps like this but actually it's not really a mappable world. The magic isn't consistent throughout the series and that there's a quote... quote. You can see how many different devices I've made notes on. Here is a paper by Daniel Lit seems like a cool dude and he talks around how the, the disc world suffers the same problems as a lot of these satires uh, the reader's suspension of disbelief I'm quoting here is repeatedly broken by blatant allusions to source texts because you've got these footnotes and these footnotes talk about the real world they talk about all other things it breaks the fourth wall and you start thinking outside the book also the plays on words also um, sort of take into account the real world and it takes you again outside the disc world. Generally in these sort of books the plot is there as a satire on and someone else's plot. This trip that Rincewind and Two Flower do around the whole of the disc world is just a play on lots of different little bits. The Colour of Magic is one of the few books that actually has chapters and each chapter is like its own sort of sto short story and it's these books in essentially Essentially, these books essentially are a travel comedy, basically, and it just keeps going. They just keep on seeing new things. This is where it is like a taster test of the Discworld, ready for the later books. You obviously at the beginning you have Ankh Morpork. Now here again, I see a slight difference with Ankh Morpork. Pratchett has said that he didn't base it on the Ankh, which is a symbol, and the Morpork, which is a bird. He doesn't really talk about exactly where he got it from but in this book I personally think it's based much more on Budapest where you've got Buddha and Pest the two halves of the city. In later books it becomes much more like London or Paris or maybe even New York but at this stage it makes sense that it's somewhere like Budapest because you've got Two Flower who is a tourist and it's the first tourist and it's the first time they've seen one and you'd, it would make sense for Agmorpork to be the foreign city. If it was based on London at that point, it stops quite making as much sense, especially with the difference in money and how much things cost between Two Flower, who just has, seems to have all the money, and Morpork, which doesn't. Um, also, Two Flower has a general sort of office job in insurance, which nobody understands, and again comes back to why the broken drum then becomes the mended drum. But Ankh Morpork definitely has a lot of the feelings that it does later on. It feels like the same city, but it just feels like it's slowly morphing into something else. The patrician is in this book, and I haven't quite worked out whether he's veterinary or not. I should probably Google this. Um, let me know in the comments is the patrician veterinary or is it? whoever it's meant to be before him. Also the librarian. Now the librarian doesn't just appear in the wizard books because he is a wizard, he is the librarian in the wizard's um, university. He also appears in oh, loads of other books, a lot of the watch books. He mostly stays in Ankh Morpork but sometimes he does leave for uh, is it the last continent where he goes off because he's gone all weird. So it was nice to see him as a human for about two seconds and in later books Rincewind is the only wizard left who can remember him before he was an orangutan, not a monkey as we all know. He used to be a wizard and in The Light Fantastic this is where he gets turned into an orangutan and by the later books the only person left who remembered him as he was is Rincewind because Rincewind just never dies whereas the other wizards all seem to die quite a lot until the very later books where Ridicully seems to stomp all that dying malarkey out. With the librarian there are rumours that the librarian's name is Dr Horace Warblehat, which comes from the Discworld Companion, I'm not going to lie, um, but that the librarian has uh, taken any sort of mention of his name out of any books, any sort of yearbooks, any photos, um, and that there is a slight smell of banana <laughs> every time you come across one of these books. Coming back to the fact that these books are satire on fantasy, they have a lot more different concept in them than the later books. While you do have things like the Pixies and We Free Men, you have the Elves in Lords and Ladies, you have Trolls, you have all these other aspects, they generally, each book will focus on one 
and grow them as a culture. So you've got books like Feet of Clay that really delves into golems and works out what they are and how they work, which then is developed on later on, say in Going Postal, but in later books he doesn't just throw in all the fantasy creatures, as many as he can, he picks one and carefully develops them. In this one he has so many things like dryads, nymphs, um, there's that bit where Rinthwin gets stuck in a tree and has to talk to the naked lady, but he, there he makes fun of the naked ladies in fantasy and things like that. And it just doesn't sit well, it's not characteristic of his writing, he doesn't seem like the sort of person who will write naked ladies. So it's very forced, and it's deliberately forced because he's making fun of it, but it just doesn't make for enjoyable reading really. So I plan to begin every one of these videos with a summary of the book and what happens. I literally can't remember what happened in these. I can remember bits and bobs and scenes, but it's an adventure series. These two books basically start with Rincewind in the city of Ankh-Morpork, um, faffing around doing his thing. He's a translator, he knows a lot of different languages. Two Flower comes along, no one else can speak to him. Rincewind comes along, manages to work out what language to chat to him in, and then Rincewind becomes his guide. Because there's this economic divide between where Two Flower comes from and Ankh Morpork, Two Flower's money is worth way more than the Ankh Morpork dollar. So he gives Rincewind like two gold coins and that's basically a fortune. And he does this, this wherever he goes and it means that everyone's basically trying to rob him. But Rincewind goes on this adventure with him because money. So they go off and they go and see all sorts of things, each bit making fun of different bits of fantasy. Everywhere, from the nymphs to the towns to the cities to riding across deserts, they do so many different things. And I haven't mentioned the luggage. The luggage is a weird invention. It's basically a massive suitcase with legs that follows Two Flower everywhere. And it's very sweet. At the end, Two Flower's like, oh, I'm going home. And he gives his luggage to Rincewind. And Rincewind's like, oh, flicking Nora, what am I meant to do with this? And then in the end keeps the luggage, which is then seen in later books. Another thing about these main characters, these are the only two characters, or three if you're counting the luggage, they're the only characters that stay all the way through. In the second one you do have Co and the Barbarian faffing around with them, um, but mainly it is these two and a half main characters. One thing I will say is there is no character development. Two Flower and Rincewind do not develop in this book. They just faff around and then Two Flower's like, I'm going home now. I think this actually really works as satire on the real life sort of aspect of when people go for their gap yard to find themselves and they come home exactly the same. And that's what happens to Two Flower. He goes away for this massive adventure where so many things happen, but he spends most of the time taking photos of things and not really working out what's really going on. Uh, Rincewind as well just spends his whole time running away from things and comes out the other end the same. Another aspect of this book to talk about is gods. He has a lot of different gods, he also has Fate and the Lady, who are they're playing a game of dice in the first book in The Colour of Magic. The gods are playing a game of dice and kind of making stuff happen to Two Flower and Rincewind. And this has some similarities to the way he treats gods later on, but it's less about those sort of small gods that are brought by people thinking about them and it's more just these random gods who are doing stuff. But he hasn't, again, fully developed his ideas of how he wants the gods to work. Now, a few random Discworld facts. The Discworld has eight days in the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Octoday. They have seven seasons and 11 months, which I do not know off by heart, but I will read them out now. Ick, Offal, February, March, April, May, June, Groon, August, Spruun, September, Ember, and December. I love the fact that they've just got random normal months in there. Um, Hogwatch is at the end of December and starts the new year. The seasons, and I do like these because they echo the sort of English seasons which are always, there's always like a false summer and things. So there's Spring Prime, which is the first spring. There's Summer, which is the midpoint and Small God's Eve. There is Autumn Prime, which is the first autumn. Then there is Winter Secondus. Then there is Secondus Spring. <laughs> then there's Summer Number Two then second is autumn, and then back spindle winter, which is where hogwash is. It just, it is how the seasons are in the UK. If anyone's watching from outside the UK, that is how our seasons feel. We kind of switch between them randomly. Um, then it rains, then it snows, then it's warm for a bit, then it snows, then it rains. So yeah, I think I've said everything I really wanted to say on these two books. Um, 
I do find them really hard to read. I managed to make it through both of them and I was well proud of myself. I did listen to the audiobooks. Light Fantastic was a lot easier than Colour of Magic. Um, even though I actually know Colour of Magic better because I did have the Tony Robinson audiobooks as a child and that's the abridged one and I used to know it really well but I don't know why it all out my mind. The other thing about the audiobooks is even if you buy them from Audible, <laughs> the quality is crap. The quality is so bad. Um, and that's obviously the only ones that exist. So I do kind of wish that they redo the earlier audiobooks because it's not till more is a kind of okay, but then it's about the sixth or seventh one where the quality starts getting better. Um, so if you are an audiobook person, just be ready for that. Just be ready to turn the volume right up so you can hear what's going on. What are my main takeaways from this? Um, firstly, I hate these books. I just, I want to like them because I love Terry Pratchett, but I can't. If you're thinking about the first books to read, um, not these, not these ones. I think they are worth reading later on, once you've read the other books, because it gives you that bit of context and it, you see where he came from. It's quite interesting to read, but if you've never read any Terry Pratchett, like, it's not the best introduction to him. And you'd be surprised about his rest, the rest of his books if you read these ones first. They are definitely a satire on fantasy, whereas the later books are satires on particular things in each book. I think that's it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've enjoyed researching it and having a read of the books again. Next I will be doing Equal Rights and then Mort. Um, and I'm quite excited about those because Mort is my favourite book, I think. I'm going to say this a lot through the series when I say books are my favourite books, but Mort was the first one I properly knew off by heart-ish. Before we go, I am going to leave uh, with a quote from Terry Pratchett. Now I'm getting this third hand, which he said in 1999 um, about his books. And if I'd written 25 versions of The Light Fantastic, by now I would have slipped my wrists. And I'm glad he didn't do that. I'm ready to move on. So now I have a question for you. What would you like to see in the future of these reviews? Would you like me to work more on the summary of the books and the plot and the themes? Would you like me to just talk more around the themes and the context and how they apply to the real world? How would you like me to do it? These two are a bit special because they're not really a satire on the real world. Comment below, let me know your favourite books, let me know your favourite characters and then I can make sure that they're included in future videos. Press subscribe and if you press the bell you'll get notifications when I bring out my next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.